a dead cop, a metal suit, and a Hong Kong producer who thought, I'd buy that for a dollar. It's a robo copy on this episode of Deja Vu. A narcotics syndicate is desperate to rid itself of its nemesis. Tom, that goddamn anti-drug agent. So it hires a Taoist priest to train hopping vampires to kill him. It's a cliche, I know, but it works. The vampires do kill Tom, but his agency has a plan. I want to make use of his body to create an android-like robot, Mr. Glenn. I'll write your applications approved. Tom is resurrected as Robo Warrior. With his increased strength and firepower, he'll have to take on the syndicate, its vampires, and a lady ghost who turns out to be the chief vampire's fiance. Meanwhile, in the Golden Triangle, Tom's colleague Ray has to rescue a fellow agent from a bunch of gangsters. Okay, so, there's a lot to unpack here. It all started with a Hong Kong outfit called Intercontinental Film Distributors. Founded in 1969 by Terry Lai and Bobby Suarez, Intercontinental eventually branched out from distributing films to producing them. Ever market savvy, Lai and Suarez knew that they could increase their product's international appeal by including Hollywood actors, which led to them casting Chris Mitchum, son of Robert, in films like Cosa Nostra Asia and Master Samurai. One of Intercontinental's employees was Terry's brother Joseph Lai. Inspired by his sister's success, Joseph decided to start his own venture. In 1973, he set up IFD Films and Arts Limited to purchase, dub, and distribute packages of low-budget Korean, Taiwanese, Filipino, and Thai movies. For a decade, he sold English-dubbed films overseas, and when the home video boom hit in the early 80s, his market became larger than ever. Unfortunately, buyers were rarely interested in Asian films. They wanted American-looking action pictures. That's when Lai recalled Intercontinental's Chris Mitchum movies and realized he could do something very similar. For each Asian movie he wanted to sell, he would shoot a few new scenes with Western actors and insert them into the film. Even better, he could tailor these new scenes and the film's English titles to imitate movies that were already popular. His first cut-and-paste feature was Mission Thunderbolt, designed to ride the coattails of Canon Film's Operation Thunderbolt. The film reworked 1982's Don't Trust a Stranger with new material starring Caucasian local Steve Daw. Later, inspired by Canon's Enter the Ninja and Revenge of the Ninja, he also cranked out dozens of ninja movies, adding candy-colored shinobi to films of all genres. Soon, titles like Ninja Terminator and Ninja the Protector were flooding French, German, Greek, Dutch, Argentinian, British, and American video store shelves. One man who saw firsthand how well this technique worked was Lai's employee and college chum, Thomas Tang. As IFD's first cut-and-paste movies hit the market, Tang took a chance and split off from Lai to form his own company, Filmark International. There, he shamelessly copied the IFD formula, churning out a slew of his own cut-and-paste ninja movies. They were so similar, in fact, that they'd eventually lead to confusion over who directed them, with many fans erroneously believing them all to be the work of IFD regular Godfrey Ho under a flurry of pseudonyms. As ninja movies became passé, IFD and Filmark would borrow from other genres to spice up their back catalogs, kickboxing, war stories, and even superheroes, sometimes more than one in the same film. So when Tang conceived Robo Vampire, it was no big deal for him to draw from two totally unrelated sources. The most obvious to Westerners, of course, is Paul Verhoeven's Robocop, with its murdered officer resurrected as a cybernetic crime fighter. Tang admitted that he was inspired by Robocop, but he was quick to note that Robo Warrior had his own distinct look. The differences, however, were more budgetary than artistic. In fact, key art for Robo Vampire explicitly depicts Robo Warrior as Robocop battling his zombie like foes. But where exactly did those hopping vampires come from, anyway? Well, broadly speaking, from Chinese folklore. Gungsi, or Jiangxi, meaning literally stiff corpse, have their roots in the literature of the Qing dynasty. They are the malevolent, reanimated bodies of those who were unburied, possessed, enchanted, or otherwise contained a surfeit of evil energy at death. Rendered inflexible by rigor mortis, Gungsi were sometimes depicted as hopping at their victims, whose life force they would consume. These stories had credibility, since ambulating corpses were more than mere superstition in China. When a person died far from their native soil, the family could hire a Taoist priest to lead the deceased home for burial. The process was cloaked in secrecy, but to onlookers it appeared as if the Taoist was reanimating cadavers and herding them across the country. In reality, the bodies were elaborately supported by the monk and an assistant, 
who might, for example, tie the corpse's arms to bamboo poles and carry the ends over their shoulders. While walking, the poles would flex, making the bodies appear to bounce along. However, Tang and company weren't drawing from these legends generally. They were specifically riffing on a recent Hong Kong hit that had catapulted Gung Si into popular culture, 1985's Mr. Vampire. While Gung Si had appeared sparsely in earlier films, like Sammo Hung's Encounters of the Spooky Kind, the horror comedy Mr. Vampire codified both their appearance and the subgenre's tropes. The creatures had to be garbed in the robes and caps of Qing Dynasty officials, and they always hopped. There was also a Taoist priest, his bumbling assistants, a monstrous uber vampire, talismans to subdue the vampires, and often a female ghost. These elements would appear in many future films, and Tang lifted all of them for Robo Vampire. Unusually for a Filmark production, Robo Vampire incorporated only a small amount of pre existing footage. The subplot involving Ray was taken from the 1984 Thai action movie Pa Lokan, starring Sor Pong Chatri. The separate plots were only nominally connected by splicing drug boss Cole into scenes with the Thai bad guys. Is everything all right? Everything's under control. No need to worry. Robo Vampire was one of several Filmark productions filmed more or less concurrently, and among the others were two sequels of a sort. Devil Dynamite continued the Gung Si theme, but starred a more kung fu oriented hero in silver called Futuristic Warrior. The Vampire is Alive, aka Counter Destroyer, briefly reprised the Robo Warrior costume while featuring Gung Si and another Sora Pong Chatri movie. But it also cribbed substantially from A Nightmare on Elm Street 2 and other Western horror films and both even threw in some ninjas, just for good measure. Old habits, like vampires, die hard. Hey, did you know Deja Vu has a book now? It's called How the World Remade Hollywood. Written by yours truly, based on years of research and interviews, How the World Remade Hollywood tells the incredible and little-known stories behind dozens of wild remakes and rip-offs. Whatever you think you know about remake exploitation, I promise you're going to be surprised. Get How the World Remade Hollywood wherever you buy books online, or ask your local library to get it for their collection and read it for free. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you next time. Thank you.